All right, friends, welcome back. I'm the Zim. This is the Zim video and the Art Professors podcast. Um, you can find it on all the podcast places, especially on YouTube. That's why I mentioned the Zim video. So if you're listening to it out there in the world somewhere um, in audio only and you found it, please go over to the YouTube channel, the Zim video on YouTube and subscribe. We're trying to get to 100,000 subscribers someday. Could this podcast grow? Give us another thousand or two subscribers. I don't know. Let's find out. Make sure you let me know. Um, jump into the comments of one of the videos or just email me or find me on Instagram or TikTok or wherever and say, hey, I f discovered your podcast. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I subscribed. That would be great. Um, all right. So let's get going. A reminder, I'm currently teaching at Missouri State University in uh, Northwest Missouri State University in uh, Northwest Missouri. And then I'm teaching graphic design and other art classes. I taught at San Diego State University last year. I went to San Diego State University for my graduate school. I went to the University of Washington for my undergrad. And we're on this journey. Um, a part of this conversation is just documenting, not only documenting my experience as a sort of new person in the field of education and art education, um, but also documenting the broader experience of what different institutions are like, um, We'll see where it goes, which will be something we address today a little bit. Uh, who knows what my future holds, but um, I have some ideas that I'm trying to go for, and we'll talk more about it today. I want to, this is probably going to be the shortest of all the podcasts so far, because I don't know, I'll try, I'll update you on what's been going on in my life in terms of teaching, but there really isn't any big topics that have come up that I can think of that will allow me to ramble on, but who knows, maybe I'll, um, stumble into something as I'm talking here and we'll figure it out. But, um, so let's get into it. First thing, I just want to update you on my journey, my life. Um, right now I am, it's getting cold here in Missouri. I finally got some base layer. So when I used to work at in Seattle, I worked in a warehouse and, um, they bought me some base layer to put on when I was in the warehouse and it was awesome. And it was this brand minus 33. And so, but I didn't realize that they had different um, kind of thicknesses and I didn't remember what thickness I they bought me. Like I didn't even know there was a difference. It turns out, so I ordered this and it turns out they bought me the kind of thickest version <laughs> of the base layer. And the one I bought is kind of like the medium version. So hopefully this will be good enough um, and hold and keep me warm as I walk to classes and not. The one thing that's like, since it's getting colder out, it's kind of wrecking havoc on my sinuses. I'm like, right now it's like my, my nose is a little bit like scratchy in a way, just because the transition between the warm rooms and cold outside. And it's just been, yeah, it's been going crazy. So hopefully I'm, I don't know, I'm in pounding water and trying to keep hydrated and make myself make sure I don't get sick or anything like that. So fingers crossed, um, we'll see how it goes, but I did get some base layer. I'm excited about it. Um, Today was my first, was it my first day? Today was my first day wearing it because I got it last night. I walked to class today. We have this thing at, at Northwest Missouri State University called Advanced Standing. So the students that are kind of so freshman, sophomore moving into their junior year, basically, um, up to like 300 level classes, they try to do this kind of, what have you done so far and have you learned anything is basically what it boils down to. and. What I'm discovering is that they really want the students to be able to talk formally about their work. That's like the, seems to be the main priority. Talking formally, talking about their work, you know, being able to um, dissect their work in a formal kind of way, but also making sure that if they're talking about what they're influenced by or what they're trying to do, know at least a little bit about the, um, world they're talking about like it's not just i'm doing this because i like it and i saw some stuff on instagram and it's kind of like rah rah in a way of an idea it's more like i'm trying to actually dig below the surface of these ideas and i want to um i'm trying to express that so which i'm not confident at this point the students have been told that they what their expectation is in this process because it is a kind of this external process um it's like you take your classes and then you have to sign up for this kind of advanced standing moment that's kind of external to your classes in a way it's like maybe your advisor helps but 
it's a little bit um there isn't really someone that's really guiding them from what i can tell right now so i've been talking about that we had a meeting about it after i did i watched or i was a part of it today and but what i've been doing with my students in my lower level classes is explaining to them like what the expectation is already i'm like okay this is what i learned you know when you go up for advanced standing remember these things you know he, what i just said it's like talk formally about your work and now i didn't say this one yet but that influence kind of part and that's it kind of works out because that's been a foundation of where i've been leaning into with my students like i um as you those of you that have been listening to this know you know I set up my foundation kind of approach to I want the students to unlock their own personal kind of uh, expression. And in that, we talk formally about the ideas. You know, we use the formal vehicles, you know, different terminologies, different principles of art to help them do unlock an idea. Um, and at the same time, I'm highly stressing that know your reference know your influences and and so hopefully as they progress along they'll continue that idea um and i think i'm doing a, i think i'm doing a good job we did have a meeting today like that same meeting this kind of topic came up of strategies around that foundational level and they they said it in a way that i haven't heard said before because uh, the way that i've come up through so the way that I am teaching foundations versus the way that I was taught foundations, actually, it's I think it's closer than I realized. But there is that that type of 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 um, professor that'll teach foundations in the very formalist way, and we've talked a lot about this. And that's sort of kind of where Northwest Missouri is right now is a very formalist version of foundations versus the conceptual. In today's conversation, other professors have had their foundations were emphasized the conceptual and the formal parts of it were like worked out along the way. And that's I'm not quite I'm like a, I'm like right in the middle of those. It's not that I'm encouraging my students to think conceptually. I'm encouraging my students to think expressively. And a lot of my students do want to they just have this burning desire to be conceptual and be narrative about their work and so hey i guess i'm closer to that idea just because the students are wanting to do that right now my foundation especially my 2d foundation course and i've been thinking a lot more about foundations um the kind of foundations idea as a whole so there's like drawing we got drawing 2d 3d and then i'm saying i would like to see a fourth foundation of you know, computer literacy, you know, basically the Adobe Creative Cloud. And I think I want to, I would add a fifth. So again, this, um, I guess we're in this reoccurring theme of what would Zim do if he built his own art school? And so there would be like this drawing, um, 2D, 3D, and com basic computer literacy with the Adobe Creative Cloud. And then the fourth, fifth, there's a fifth foundation. I think performance and um, social practice and how does that I'm, I'm i reached out to a friend of mine who's a performance artist and i'm going to have him on my other podcast soon my conversations with creatives um we're going to work that out but he i want to ask him about this concept of how does performance art fit within the biggest picture and and social practice i think because my lack of knowledge at this point i feel like social practice and performance art can live together because oftentimes it is an act like a performative element to social practice so i think but obviously performance art itself can go way in a lot of crazy different places but i think as a foundational level class there could be this performance art and foundation i mean performance art and social practice conversation within the same class maybe it's divided in half or like however it works so i'm really curious because i feel like i was thinking about how do those artists that want to go that performance art social practice what does the traditional foundation off, foundations offer them um other than knowing how to talk about the broad art world but not necessarily talk to them about their own desire for their practice and i think there's a lot of artists that especially i think there's a lot of 
artists, young artists, especially that don't even know that there's these other forms of expression that live with under the umbrella of art, um, social practice and performative art being them. And when, if the focus is so highly focused on artifact art making the, you know, drawing is, there's a very specific type of, you know, content around the drawing class, the 2d design class is sort of this opportunity to really explore a lot of different spaces i feel like and that's where i've been kind of discovering more it's like okay i don't want it to be another drawing class how do, can this class be just open up the possibilities for students um and maybe there's a, an, a way for that to be happening in drawing as well but re i really feel like the 2d design class now that i'm doing it um, is like there's so much possibility to really spread the students wings about what's possible with art making especially these young students as i've said before coming in from high school or wherever where they're used to drawing you know maybe they're really focused on realism and maybe they're really focused on drawing with line and maybe they're really focused like they haven't really ex they don't even know what the possibilities are so in my class i really want to push their boundaries of like what they can explore with those that that idea and i haven't taught a three-dimensional design class but obviously that's important and maybe that's you know that's the maybe possibly that's part of the bridge into performative work in a way because because it exists like as a you know like this kind of space i don't know maybe not i mean i could see there being a bridge between sculpture and perform because you become the sculpture like the living sculpture performative work is like a living sculpture in a way so there could be a bridge there um but but i really feel like there's an opportunity for sort of this foundational level performative and social practice class that's every every student has to take as an artist especially because i don't think i really don't think the formal what what i feel like some art schools or some mentality of what it means to be an artist is learn about these basic principles and master them early and i don't think that's important i think the expression and discovery is what's more important and then those that are attracted to certain ways of expressing can start to master those ones um further along like i think that's an interesting idea the mastery of of kind of foundational principles comes later so i am um going farther than i thought mastery of foundational principles comes in the higher level of classes which is an interesting um way to think I th oh man i think i've i think i just stumbled onto something brilliant there <laughs> i don't know maybe it's already the way people think about it but because it really honestly my influence has been there's this idea that these basic principles of art are taught at the beginning and then you move into conceptual work where it's like, what if that paradigm was shift more? It's like you start conceptually and you encourage um, principles, but you don't worry as much about them. Because I have personally have not been encouraging conceptual, conceptualism. I've been encouraging expressionism and just discovering ways to make marks and make ideas. So hmm, interesting. Cool. So that's uh, what's going on there. I don't know where I got to that, but we have what's called advanced standing. Um, we did that the last this week, a bunch of uh, a handful, maybe about nine students were went through advanced standing. And then in not next week, but two weeks from now, we have what's called senior review. So it's kind of like the the final final for our seniors that are graduating this semester. And then we'll do it all again next semester for those that are advancing and um, senior reviewing. So I'll keep you posted on that. The main topic of today's podcast is it's application season. So I'm part of the CAA website, which is like College Art Association or something like that. Um, I signed up for it and I'm starting to get more and more emails. And I got one not too long ago because I signed up for to be notified of certain positions. And I got, and so it's like the graphic design and draw anything that has to do with graphic design and anything that has to do with like drawing. And luckily this one position posted to my email um, from the University of Washington and um, it's for interdisciplinary kind of art, a tenure track position for interdisciplinary art. 
and this is where at the earlier in the podcast I was saying, well, I'm not sure, you know, there's, I've been saying for a long time that I want to keep doing this visiting faculty kind of idea with my career. And I still like the idea. And if there's one place that I would be like willing to go, I'm here, I'm willing to dedicate to this place. I'm willing to give it 100%. I'm willing to commit to it. It would be the University of Washington, just because, I mean, my personal experience there was amazing. It's a big school. It's an R1, what they say, research one, I guess, institution, which is what I kind of want. That's what they, the place that I want to be at is that kind of big school, division one, R1 kind of atmosphere is really what I want to go for. And, and it's also like my home, even though it's the only really at this point that I could think of, unless, yeah, it's the only thing that would bring me back to the Northwest um, would be getting a position at the University of Washington. And I've, you know, I don't know, I've vision boarded that kind of concept. I've tried, I'm trying to manifest that kind of concept because I do that. The idea of being closer to my family in a sense, my kids again, like my kids, mom's family will is, will be in the Northwest forever. So my kids will always have a reason to be there for very, you know, either visit or whatnot, depending on what, they end up doing i mean there is the chance that because they're my son's a senior this year my daughter's a sophomore um there's a chance within a few years they both could be gone and i would be in the northwest um again without them anyway but um who knows i can't think too much about that but what if i do get the position like next year i don't think my son's ready to just take off um, and go somewhere else. I think he was saying he wants to kind of maybe not even go to college right out of high school, which is totally fine by me. But, and if I get in the University of Washington as a professor, I can, I think most schools allow the, you know, student, the, the family of faculty to get discount at the school. So if he decides to go there and wants to apply, um, that's a possibility. And it's my daughter as well, but she has a few more years. Um, so that would be, and, and just like, I just, I do love the Northwest, especially now that I've experienced more of the world a little bit more. I mean, there's still tons that I haven't, but just there's a there's a lot of factors that would make me say I'd be I'd be very uh, content. You know, I would be able to let go of the the what the FOMO, the fear of missing out of discovering more about the diff the country, and if I could get there, I mean, cost of living is high, but the pay is much higher than it is right now um in terms of they they their start their salary is like 75 to 90 is like the what they wrote on the application and so um yeah i would you know we'll see we'll see what that what happens there so um i've applied the bottom line is i've applied i applied a couple of days ago so fingers crossed that maybe i can be in in the conversation of like the consider who knows i there is still also the possibility like it will be highly competitive definitely highly competitive um there'll probably be hundreds of applications am i do have i done enough at this point to stand out i know this is the question i have for you if you're listening should i reach out to people i know there and tell them i applied um because i know i don't know i feel very confident that the people that i know genuinely think i'm a a good human being and probably would wouldn't mind at all working with me but i also don't want to make it seem like i'm trying to i don't know i just don't want it to seem like a certain way and i know that's part of the game is the who you know thing i don't know i don't know we'll see we'll have to decide i mean i'm sure the applications are due on the first it's the third right now for the first round of applications um i don't know maybe within this month they might start looking at them and calling people i don't know I, I don't know i have no idea what the how it, it'll look in terms of timeline so we'll see because it is like the first like this is the first batch i'm seeing a lot more requests for tenure track positions like every week i get an email with two or three new positions um I, this will probably be the only place that i'll apply for a tenure track position not until um the like the spring you know late spring what i discovered from last year even kind of into the summer 
was all the visiting faculty positions started to populate. So I'll definitely apply to like every single one of those that I, that makes sense for me. Um, and maybe it'll be easy to get one of those or not. Um, so we'll see, but yeah, so the application process has started or like, like, yeah, for next year. Um, so what is it? November 3rd. So keep that in mind. If you're thinking about doing this journey, this is when it starts November, you know, November, October, October, November is when it starts for the following year. All right. So with that in mind as well, I did get some feedback um, on my resume. So I'll link up my personal resume in my in the description. I have it on my website under or not resume, my CV. Um, I have it on my website. So we've talked about uh, artist statements before. We've talked about teaching philosophy. I don't know if we talked about artist statement actually, but we've talked about teaching philosophy. And I had a couple podcasts ago. We we were kind of looking at the teaching philosophy and writing about it. And I rewrote my teaching philosophy, added some things that I talked about before, adjusted the language a little bit to be more, to flow better and be a little more accurate to what it is that this new concepts that I've wanted to make sure were prevalent in my teaching philosophy. Like um, one of the things that I can think of that wasn't in my old one was um, teaching, like learning by teaching. So getting, finding opportunities to have the students lead the lessons um that's kind of one of the one of the aspects off obviously the community building is super important to me um and those ideas and um, we can visit that again if you have more questions so feel free to jump in the comments and let me know if you want to dig deeper into teaching philosophy again but today we'll look at just our resume idea and so essentially what i was advised is with these positions that there's a lot of position there's potentially highly uh competitive positions a lot of applications, you know, your CV anyway, I was advised to make it very, very, very clear. So it's really easy to see what different categories are presented, what you've done. And so let me just explain this. If you feel like going to my website, the zim.com and scrolling all the way to the bottom, there's a text that says CV. You can click on that. You can open it up and you can see my CV that I'm talking about right now, um, at least November 3rd, 2023. Um, and what I, what was, so the way that I have my header at the top, the current address, my email, my website right at the top. And then right underneath of that is my education. And I was advised, I got rid of, like I used to have my associate's degree on there as well. And I got rid of that. So now it's just my BFA and MFA on there um, with the, each section is capital letters like education in capital letters with a space with the year with another tab space and then the description like mfa graphic design school of art and design san diego state university um and then so each section has that sp that very clear this is that section because before i had the bold letters but it was like lower it was like just capital at the start and then lowercase the rest of the way but now it's capital all the way. So it's very, okay, that's that. Like the hierarchy is very clear in what's happening. And then the next one going down, and I was advised that for like R1 institutions, they want the to see the research more than your educate, like your teaching history. So at first I was told the opposite um, when I was like coming out of grad school and they were saying your, and the, the books we were reading says your edu your teaching kind of background should go first. But I was then av now advised like, no, flip that, put your kind of research first. So we moved my research into like solo exhibitions first. I have a few there, group exhibitions underneath that. And then as it scrolls down after group exhibitions, we have a press is the next one. And I actually thankfully have like one, one article that was written about me on the internet. So that's pretty awesome from my Katanji Brown Jackson. Underneath that we have grants and awards. So I got, I got a bunch of grants and awards during graduate school, which we'll talk more about, but I'll just throw a quick note in here. I'm applying to more grants and I'm looking for more grants to apply to. And I've had a new philosophy. We'll, we'll hold that thought. We'll pin that grants. I'm going to write this down so I don't forget. Um, We'll go back to grants in a second after we talk about this. Um, and then underneath the grants and awards, we have teaching experience down here. And the way it's like, I used to have it. So um, it was the kind of where I taught and then the classes I taught were kind of in line with all that. So it was like 
you know, brand identity, typography, blah, blah, blah. It was like in line. So it's kind of hard to kind of really pick out each one. And we move, change that to bullet points. So it's like where I taught and then bullet point list of 2D brand identity, senior seminar, typography, digital photography, you know, advertising design. It's like very clear. And then uh, on its way down, like when I taught at SDSU, packaging design and digital media. Um, so it's like, it, it stands out much more than it did before. And then under that neat, that is service. So at the current school I'm at, I've done things and I guess we can qualify just attending meetings as service. So a, a department meetings, faculty meetings, it's part of service. Um, see that senior review and, and advanced standing that I was talking about is part of service internship advisor, undergraduate independent study advisor, um, and participation in campus talks. I did, I'm doing a workshop next week with, um, the art education department. And I did, a, a panel discussion last week that I think I might have mentioned. About. No, that's something that we could talk about. I no, I did. I must have mentioned it because I think I recorded my podcast after that. So yeah, we talked about that already. It's called Meet the Pros, um, and that was cool. So we talked about that last week. Um, so that's you know part of service. And then at San Diego State University, I was um, part of the diversity and inclusion committee as a grad student to service. And then the last, very last thing is the collections my work's in. And I have Katanji Brown Jackson as one collection and this architecture of the book collection in Salem, New York, um, who bought a bunch of my books off of Etsy a while ago and talked to me about it. So just another thing I can put in there uh, for collections. So that's kind of like the breakdown of the res, like the CV, um, very a lot clearer. And thankfully I had the, the person that helped me kind of relook at it is actively part of a search committee and is like, this is my experience. And this is, I think this will be helpful. <laughs> you know, so, you know, thank you very much for that. If you're listening to this podcast, uh, my friend, and hopefully we'll talk soon in person. But, um, yeah, so I applied with the, the application to the university of Washington. Um, they wanted, um, the CV obviously cover letter portfolio of just your work. So I, I tried, I updated my portfolio, added a few things, but also added some more diverse things like I added my tunnel books in there, which when I was applying to th this job at Northwest Missouri, I didn't have my tunnel books in my portfolio at all. So I'm trying to diversify my portfolio because it is an interdisciplinary um, kind of, um, you know, position, especially. Um, so there's that. And then they also want my artist statement and my diversity and inclusion statement and my teaching philosophy. So that's what I sent to them. And so fingers crossed, I get a call back. I don't know. Part of me feels very confident. Part of me is like, of course, <laughs> it's like, what, I mean, I'm, I really feel like, I really feel like I'm in the starting lineup easily in the starting lineup. You know, that I, I may not be, you know, I'm not a legend yet, but I'm in the starting lineup. Um, if not the starting lineup, I'm the sixth man. I'm like, right. The first one off the bench and in terms of, and what it what is like, what are you talking about Zim? in terms of like the quality that I bring? I mean, I know I get my students engaged. They, they enjoy my, my, they listen to me. They, it, I build a community. I, I don't know. I just really, really feel confident that I am in the starting lineup and let's go, you know? And so, I feel confident that a school like a large school like the University of Washington would benefit from my um, kind of uh, being there. The one things that the things that I'm still learning, which I'm learning more and more, is like how do I get exhibitions? That's the big thing. But that kind of ties into the next thing I want to talk about is grants. So I'm applying. I've applied to the Hopper Prize, and I'm about to apply to the CAA grant. But I'm also looking for more grants because I've, I've made this kind of distinct, this shift in thinking about that kind of thing. I, for the longest time when I was an undergrad or graduate student, especially I was, I was really confused about the application of grants. Um, because it's like, it's not enough to, to do, to live off of or anything like that. It's not enough to like pay rent. It's solely designed to help make the art so you really need in my opinion unless you're really good at grant writing and you're getting a lot of big grants that you can live off part of it and make art but but that's you know i think that's pretty rare so more often if you do get grants you're getting like a, a little bucket of money here and there 
to help make the work, but not necessarily make, help you survive. And so it's very um, contingent on, you know, having some steady income somewhere, like if you're teaching, especially, I mean, that's one thing, or if you have a thriving practice that you're selling work or whatever, um, that's another thing. But so the grant writing is, or like getting grants is like um, <clears throat> just a supplement in a way. And so I'm trying to look for more opportunities because it, it sounds to me, there are definitely some grants, a lot of grants out there that are like very specific. You have to be doing this type of work. You have to be this type of person. You have to be this type of artist. And so like you, I'm excluded from a whole bunch of them, but there are also a whole bunch of grants out there that are like, we just want to give you money to make art. <laughs> and so those are essentially the, the grants that I'm applying to. And so, well, the second one, the CAA grant is like, you have to be a part of the CAA. So I paid for the membership there. And then you have to be an MFA graduate and you have to be currently teaching full or part-time. So check all those boxes. So it's still like that grant itself is narrow in one way, but obviously it's going to be highly competitive. Um, so, um, yeah, but I'm just going to be starting to look around for more grants, especially now that I feel like my resume, my CV looks way better. My work, you know, that Katanji, for me, that Katanji Brown Jackson work is like the, the, the golden ticket. And now that I'm going to be doing it again next summer with my, um, Tennessee exhibition with, of Justin Jones and Justin Pearson, I think that potentially will be like another really notch on, you know, like really good thing to have versus just a piece of artwork I made um, and maybe a smaller exhibition. I don't know. So my goal will just be to continue, try to get like maybe summer exhibitions around and eventually like really, really hope to get invited. Like people seek me out, they eat, they, they look for me. They're like, oh, let's have this person do work in our space. I would love to get to that point where I'm, I'm, I'm seeked out. They're like, Zim, we want you, we saw your exhibition of Katani Brown Jackson or Justin Jones and Justin Pearson. We like what you're doing. Will you do th something in our space? And I'm like, yeah, sign me up. <laughs> let's go. So, um, let's see what happens with all that. All right. Next up. What do we got here? Um, I think that's it. We have three weeks left of classes. So this this class this year this week was our fourth. Or we had four weeks left. We have three weeks left now of actual teaching of like class work. We have inside of those, or in addition to those three weeks, we have Thanksgiving break. I really try my best to not make the students. I don't want to sign work over those breaks. I just say if you are not finished with your work, you know that that's the time that you can get caught up. But um, I don't assign work uh, during that break. So then we have a so we have two weeks essentially until Thanksgiving. With Thanksgiving break, we have a week when between Thanksgiving and finals week. And the finals week in my classes, we don't really do finals. There maybe one of my classes we will actually do class work because I want to give them the option of having just a little bit more time. But I think for three of my four classes that are my studio classes, um, it'll be like, we'll just get together and have pizza or, or donuts, depending on the time and, um, hang out and kind of take pictures and say, thanks for being in the class and then go on to the next thing. But, um, and then I, my one class, my senior seminar class, I think that class will also be a pre that we're going to be doing little short mini artist talks, like 10 minute artist talks, um, about their work and their, their kind of idea. So, because not all of them, but cause that meet the pros thing that I was talking about before they had the opportunity to kind of share their portfolio with the kind of professionals and not all of them did it. So the ones that didn't do it have to do a, a mini presentation of themselves at the end of class. That's my goal. That's what's happening. All right. I think that's it. That's all I had to say today. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, tell your friends about the podcast. Let me know if there's anything you would like me to get into. This turned out to be a pretty good one. It's like 35 minutes. So that's respectable. Went on some tangents there. And then until next week, um, we'll t I'll probably start, I don't know. I need to start reaching out to other professors to see if I can get them to come on and talk to me about their experience. Different places around the country it would be great. So. Maybe I'll try to start doing that because I'm worried about running out of things to say. So we'll see. But there's been enough to say so far. But again, as always, be loving, kind, and patient. And we'll catch up with you again real soon. Peace, friends. Mm -hmm.